Our next okay. speaker need, <laughs> needs no introduction. <laughs> um, hopefully by now you know I'll know Arita, the Belltown Chief, who's going to teach us about lipids. And I'm Great. excited. Thank you so much for that introduction, Nikki. <laughs> um, <laughs> Uh, I think I know all of you. I'm currently the Belltown Chief. I have no, oh, why is this? Oh, wait, I have no disclosures other than I am not an endocrinologist. So um, take that as you will. Hopefully we'll be one in three years. Um, this talk is a very broad topic. I gave a subset of this yesterday at Primary Care Lightning Rounds, um, hoping to give the full talk today, which is going to go over lipids as a whole, but focusing primarily on statins and then focusing particularly on kind of some of the new data around risks of statins, additional tools we can use for determining who needs to be on a statin for primary prevention. We'll talk a little bit about triglycerides if we have time. I might just skip that one in the interest of time, depending on how we're doing on time, just to get to the cases. So I felt that it would be remiss to give a talk on lipids without sharing some of the pathophysiology, which is actually pretty complex. So I'm not going to go into it on, in any real detail. Um, but the, the basic story is you eat food, you get these chylomicrons that are then transported to the liver. And a lot of complex things happen at that point, which involve LDL, HDL, and VLDL. Um, and generation of those particles. What I kind of want to highlight here is not so much the details of that, but what the lipid panel that we get in the computers actually means. LDL, what we're looking at when they say LDLC, it's LDL cholesterol. So it's, it's the cholesterol in these particles because what makes something LDL or HDL or VLDL is the proteins attached to the cholesterol, the cholesterol esters, the lipoproteins. So it's not really HDL that we're looking at when we say HDL, it's HDLC. It's the cholesterol in an HDL particle. And that's because we think that the cholesterol in an HDL particle is, for example, better than the, or less dangerous for cardiovascular disease, or even beneficial for cardiovascular disease, because it's um, the one that's being scavenged back to the liver rather than circulating in the bloodstream. Um, the only other point I want to make on this slide is that we don't, of all the things on that lipid panel, which I put should have actually put that on the slides too, but I think we all know it's LDL, HDL, triglycerides, and total cholesterol. Of all of those, the one that's actually calculated and not measured is LDL. And the reason for that is to back it out of total cholesterol, you need to estimate VLDL, or very low density lipoprotein, which I won't bore you with the details of, of what that is exactly, but just to know that it's an equation. And so, you know, we used to say you have to be fasting, and that was because the equation would get messed up if your triglycerides are too high. That's basically no longer true. The triglycerides can be up to 800 now, and it's still accurate with this new equation. You might have noticed that you may not be able to see LDL if you're looking back at the, like, lab reports view, and that's because the equation changed, so you can't, you can compare. I mean, I do compare, but from a formal mathematical perspective, I guess the lab doesn't want you to compare. And so you will just see the LDL for that year, but you won't necessarily see it for the prior years. And that's because the equation changed last year. You can get a direct LDL. Like if their triglycerides are a thousand, they have familiar, familial hypertriglyceridemia. You could either have them fast or you could just get the direct LDL. It's just like a more expensive, more logistically challenging test. And that particle here on the right, I don't know if you can see the mouse, that is cholesterol. That is actually the cholesterol that we're measuring, the only thing that we're actually measuring in all these numbers. Okay, so with that, I'm going to go a little bit more into screening for hyperlipidemia. I want to, I think screening is not really that useful to talk about because really we should probably be screening everybody. I really go by ACCHA, um, which is really just screen everyone over 20, why not? Um, Whereas, you know, as it kind of always is, USPSTF is is much more conservative about who to screen. And it really doesn't have any recommendation for screening women who are not increased risk, but recommends screening all men starting at 35 and women at, and all people at risk at 20, and then women at 45 if they have risk. So I would just say start screening everybody at 20 every five years. Um, the meat of this talk is kind of going to be talking about statins and primary prevention, because I think that's the part of this all that has the most nuance and controversy. 
Um, I'm just going to start out with some epidemiology and some um, info on statins themselves. I think we all know about the different intensities, but I would just point out that even between rosuvastatin and atorvastatin, there are significant differences in potency. You can see on the bottom left that, for example, at 40 milligrams, a 20 milligram dose of rosuvastatin is about equivalent in potency to an 80 milligram dose of atorvastatin. So you can get a little bit more by switching them to rosuvastatin 40. Um, I don't think any of us need to be told that, you know, the epidemiology for secondary prevention is very good. <laughs> um, but I think um, there's more maybe controversy, confusion about what the exact epidemiology is for primary prevention. So I'll just ask you to answer this question. What is the number needed to treat for a statin to prevent one cardiovascular disease event? Um, understanding, of course, that this may be, this is in a broad population level. And if you take into account specific risk factors for a particular individual, it may be very different. It may be much lower. And maybe we can do a poll for this. Maybe I can't see the poll. Can I not see the polls? Okay. For some reason I can't see the polls. Maybe if you like make me a co-host, I'll be able to see. The no. I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. I okay. Just, sorry. I um my my work mouse is not the most responsive. <laughs> no worries. <laughs> Okay, one more second. Go share results. Perfect. Yeah, so this is kind of what I wanted to get at. It's actually more like one in 40. I think when I made this talk, I thought it was like one in 400. So I was pleasantly surprised that it's much better than I thought it was. And I don't want to focus too much on this part of the talk because I don't think it changes management too much. But just to say, statins are a very good tool, even for primary prevention, which is something I think that gets lost sometimes. Um, this is not from a talk on lipids. This data is from a talk on numbers needed to treat, but they correlated with some other resources I could find that compared to a lot of other things that we do in primary care, statins are pretty high up there in terms of um, good at number needed to treat for primary prevention. And that's, I think, all I'll say about that. And I won't really get into this. The guideline, there was a big guideline change in 2013 that basically statins didn't used to be recommended for people who had LDL less than 100, and that chain made a lot more people statin eligible. Um, not going to go into that. So this is really like the meat of my talk here. What I want to talk about is, I think a lot of us, myself included, even before I made this talk or before I started practicing at Belltown this year, um, really had this like four bucket framework in my mind of like, okay, you've got your people with LDL over 190, may or may not have familial hypercholesterolemia kind of more of a like almost secondary prevention kind of mindset with them. And then your secondary prevention folks. And like, I know what to do with those people, but what do you do with everybody else? Um, and it used to kind of just be like, is there ASCVD risk score greater than 7.5? If so, put them on a statin, maybe moderate, maybe high if they have additional risk factors, but they should be on a statin, right? That really all changed with the 2018 guidelines, which I feel like maybe didn't make as much of a splash because they do introduce a lot more ambiguity. So you can see here, and what I'm focusing on is these red and green boxes that, so less than 5% ASCVD risk score. And on a later slide, you know, a lot of people will ask, well, is ASCVD risk score even accurate for my patient? That is a good question that I'll get into later. But I think part of that is why these guidelines changed and why kind of between 5 to 20%, there's a lot of clinician discretion as to who you should put on a statin. And these guidelines really introduce the idea of the risk enhancers as additional tools to determine who in this kind of intermediate risk bucket should be put on a statin. And so I'll just quickly kind of talk about the risk enhancers. And then later I'll talk about the coronary artery calcium score tool, which is unfortunately not often covered by insurance, but I think in a lot of people is very, very helpful kind of way of figuring out should my patient really be on a statin for primary prevention. Okay, so kind of just to summarize the changes in the new guidelines, the new guidelines introduce two new concepts. One is this concept of taking into account risk enhancers for these borderline and intermediate risk 
group people, that's those with risk between 5 and 7.5% and 7.5 and 20% respectively. And then it also actually snuck in a new recommendation for people 20 to 39. If you remember, the old guidelines really only address the 40 to 75 age group. And that's probably because we only have the ASCVD risk score for those groups, for that group rather. But here you can see there is actually a recommendation now for those with family history and an LDL over 160 to consider a statin, even in people starting as young as age 20. And of course, familial hyperlipidemia, you, you would start at any age. Um, okay. So let's talk a little bit more about these risk enhancers, because I do think a lot of times the new, the old guidelines were nice. You were like, okay, what's the risk score? Is it greater than 7.5? Okay, start a statin. Um, and now it's really much more at your discretion. Um, the risk enhancers are some lab markers, ethnicity, South Asian ancestry, and then um, some other factors like family history and the level of all the elevation. The only real risk factors I ever get are LPA and APOB. Um, I've never really ordered a high sensitivity, sensitivity CRP. And then an ABI, I mean, if they have peripheral arterial disease, usually you'd know that. So I probably wouldn't order that specifically to decide whether to put someone on a statin. Um, this is another kind of, I think, big, like, mind frame paradigm change for me from the old guidelines is, I think I had it in my head, you know, it's like, okay, everybody for primary prevention, just titrate it to get their LDL below 100. For secondary prevention, like, really as low as you can go, but at least less than 70. And I'll get to this in a later slide, but I think a lot of the new data that's come out around risk, particularly at high dose, high intensity statins for diabetes has given us pause around how aggressive we need to be in lipid lowering for those who um, are on a statin for primary prevention. It's no longer really recommended to just drive their LDL down less than 100 by trying to push up the statin as much as you possibly can. It's more like just saying, put these people on a moderate intensity statin and hope for this dose change. And you can, you know, start at rosuvastatin five and increase to 10 if you need, but I wouldn't just start someone, put someone up to rosuvastatin 40 just to get their LDL less than 100 if you're doing this for primary prevention. Another question I think that comes up for me a lot with patients is like, they say, well, my LDL is like 75, my LDL is 85. You're telling me my ASCVD risk is, you know, 17%, 14%, but my LDL is good. So does this apply to me? And yes, this, this applies to everybody with LDL between 70 and 189. Um, and that's true for people with diabetes. That's true for pretty much everyone. So um, the, the guy, other, other than those folks with LDL greater than 190, all of these other things apply all the way down to an LDL of 70. Below that, it's shared decision making. Um, but there were, and then I think there was some data that came out a few years ago about, uh, uh, ago about this risk of hemorrhagic stroke, pushing people's LDLs down too low. That hasn't really been materialized in future studies. So, um, the most recent meta-analysis in JAMA cardiology actually found cardiovascular benefit, um, even down to an LDL 20. Of course, these were in patients for secondary prevention. So take that with a grain of salt, if you will. This is the slide that I was alluding to earlier. I want to kind of focus on the part of the slide with the little red box around it. So I think a lot of us often wonder, like we know that if we put in, say, a 75-year-old man into this ASCVD risk score, their risk will be probably elevated no matter what. And that is true. There is significant, and I don't know fully why, but this study showed there's basically, so the like light-colored bar is observed and the whole bar is... Um, predicted by ASCVD risk score, and there's a significant um, overestimation that gets worse, particularly at older ages. Um, Arita, can I ask you a question from the chat? Yes, please do. I'm not sure if you came across this in your reading, but to diagnose someone with like a familial hyperlipidemia, do we do you recommend sending genetic testing, referring to endo, going off just positive family history, ordering, like, are you routinely ordering apolipoproteins and things oh. like that from the primary care setting? That's a really good question. So I think like true familial hyperlipidemia is really rare and usually we'll have a family history and those people should just be referred to endo and probably will need to get genetic testing. Um, but then you have those people who are just like high risk, like maybe 
they have some like family history of cardiovascular disease that may be lipid related. Like familiar hy familial hypercholesterolemia is a bit of a fraught term because I think a lot of people have hypercholesterolemia that's genetic, but I wouldn't consider them to have like what we consider familial hypercholesterolemia, which is usually like L LDL over 190 over even over 200 with like history of, you know, heart attacks early in family members. Um, the ApoB and the LPA can basically be useful for any patient with like a family history of premature ASCVD, uh, ASCVD or if you're like unsure of whether to start a statin and want to get more information. Um, so I wouldn't only order those in people that I'm worried about familial hypercholesterolemia. I just view those as risk enhancers. But if they truly have like LDL in the 200s, like strong family history, those people should see an endocrinologist get genetic testing. Their like first degree relatives need to be tested, et cetera. But that's like a pretty small number of people. Um, because there are like many different types of defects in the LDL receptor you can have. And yeah. Okay. Um, serious side effects from statins are actually pretty rare. So I won't really even talk about them. I'm talking about like rhabdo or acute liver injury. Um, but the one that we think about most often is myalgia. So that is my next question. If someone develops myalgia while on a statin, you should. I'm on it. Give me one second. Okay. Oh, this is an E back there we go guys you'd think i would know how to do this after eight months of being a chief what i always forget to do is close the poll because <laughs> i can see the results but no one else can <laughs> I, th I realize this is a bit of a like reading question the answers are coming in okay we're gonna give it a few more seconds okay. so most popular answer was e but a mix of b d c okay d. great yeah so uh, answer is actually d um discontinue, check these labs, and then wait for symptom resolution before restarting a different statin or dose. Because if you are if you don't do that, they're probably just going to have to continue to have side effects and like self-discontinue it anyways. So you want it to, if, if it is truly a myalgia caused by like a cytochrome issue or something like that, you do want to give time for it to wash out of their system before like, um, rather than just kind of continuing it. Um, I think I would say like, this is if you truly, the question is like, do you truly believe there's, which is like more of a philosophical question than a question I can answer in a talk. Like, do you truly believe their myalgias are statin related? If not, then E is very reasonable. And I would argue you don't really need to do anything other than counsel them that their side effects don't sound statin related. But in, in practice, when most people have myalgias and are on a statin, they're going to believe that their stat myalgias are statin related and so even if you don't believe so, it's going to be an uphill battle to convince them to keep taking the same statin at the same dose. I think the other alternative on this that might be reasonable is to dose reduce the same statin. Um, but basically, the point here is that based on, you know, this Lancet study came out that said most of the muscle symptoms that people developed while on a statin were not due to the statin. And I don't know how they came to that conclusion, but, you know, people develop myalgias for all kinds of reasons, and they know that statins cause myalgia. So certainly there is some element of the, the opposite of the placebo effect. Um, but I think the important thing to know is that they can be real. And if they're real, it may be because they have an underlying condition that's predisposing them to myopathy. And so getting these labs can help make sure that you're not missing something like they have thyroid myopathy. And that's why they develop myopathy on a statin. It could also just be a cytochrome issue with other medications they're on, particularly fibrates and HIV drugs. So that is something else to be mindful of. Um, some people may ask you if they should take CoQ10. There's no real harm, but there's no real evidence that it helps. Um, it may be involved in the mechanism, but it probably doesn't help. And so the only real like absolute contraindication to starting this, stopping the statin is if they have rhabdo or acute liver injury. Otherwise, 
there's not really a harm to continuing, but most people find these side effects pretty bothersome if they truly have myalgias. And so it's probably reasonable to stop the one they're on and try another one. Um, you know, fluvastatin, provastatin, and pitavastatin were shown to have the lowest risk, but I think there's, unfortunately, anecdotally, I'll say that a lot of people will try provastatin if people have myalgias on other statins. It's sort of like viewed as the one with the least side effects, but in reality, everybody has different cytochrome enzymes, and maybe in the future, we'll have like genetic testing to determine who should get one statin, which statin, but we don't have that right now. Um, and then if they have to be on a high intensity statin, like history of cardiovascular disease, then you could just try the other high intensity statin or dose reduce the one that they're on after that washout period. This is kind of like the hot topic in lipids, endo, statins right now is do statins cause diabetes? Um, for a long time, I was convinced that the answer was no, and this was all about a hullabaloo over nothing, and was disappointed to find out that you know, this is a real signal. It's a small effect, probably 255 patients for four years to cause one case in some studies, maybe more in others. And it really depends on the intensity of the statin. So basically, you're going to get the most incident cases of diabetes on rosuvastatin 40 because it's just the most potent. That's not to say that this should at all scare you about using statins and people who need them but perhaps should give pause in using high intensity statins and people who are not high risk, if that makes sense. So to that end, and then like everything in life or in medicine, unfortunately the risk is greatest in those that are already at high risk. So you can see that, for example, here, the increased risk on a statin versus placebo, that like the diff, well, overall the risk obviously of developing diabetes is much higher if you have prediabetes, but there's like this synergistic event effect where there's a two times different like the statin adds two times here if you're pre-diabetic whereas if you're not there's really no difference between placebo and statin and that's also demonstrated on this lower right hand side graph so in people who are not pre-diabetic even pushing them from a torva 10 to torva 80 didn't really increase the incidence of new onset diabetes but if they did have pre-diabetes then there's like a pretty significant small but clinically and statistically significant difference between a Torva 10 and a Torva 80. Um, so a hazard ratio of 1.2 in those who are pre-diabetic versus 1.08 in those who are not. So that leads me to my next question. For someone with like an intermediate ASCVD risk, so say like 10%, between 7.5 and 20, one other risk factor, so LDL of 170, but no other risk factors, what... Um, what approach would you, and there could be more than one right answer here, so just pick which answer you think is the best. Would you start rosuvastatin at a moderate intensity dose or start a high intensity statin at a moderate intensity dose, recommend only lifestyle changes, start a, a moderate intensity only statin, or start with any moderate intensity statin, um, but increase to a high intensity statin if you can't get their LDL below target of 100? And there are maybe multiple right answers here. Okay. Um, sorry. Great. Okay, love it. Okay, so this highlights a really interesting. So I would also probably do A. Um, A is definitely a good answer. Um, C is also. So I'm curious if someone like wants to say, um, why they didn't pick C. Because it's so few people pick C. I'm just curious. But I could just go over it hey, too. Can Hi, you Gina. guys hear me? We can. So I picked, I picked A because I feel like I typically think of like a Torvastatin or a Suvastatin as like maybe like in my head the more effective ones. But I also feel like they're the like ones that people tend to have side effects to. So my thought process is, oh, I'll try these and then I'll have an option to go to if they don't tolerate it well with maybe like pravastatin or something like that. 
Great. Yeah, no, I, I really like that thinking. Um, I think what I want to get at here is I think like more is not better when it comes to statins, like for these moderate risk people, like for, they only just need a moderate intensity statin. And the, really the benefit of a Torva Rosuva statin is that you can push it to a high intensity. But if they don't need a high intensity statin, then it would be perfectly fine to just start, which is like something that I think has changed my thinking after doing this talk is, you know, I kind of had the approach before that more is better when it comes to statins, but the new guidelines really emphasize that for these very moderate risk people, like moderate intensity, 30 to 49% lowering, you don't need to get them push their LDL below 100. Um, is fine. So I think either approach would be fine. I think in practice, most of us are just more comfortable with rosuvastatin and torvastatin, and so we'd probably start those, but it would be totally fine to start a moderate intensity statin as well. But like, you don't need to worry about the incident risk of diabetes at a moderate dose of a high intensity statin. I think all of these honestly would be fine, except D. The one I really, what I really wanted to point out in this slide is don't do D. Like, don't put them on risk of a statin 40 just to get their LDL below 100 if they're not really high risk. Um, are we being too conservative in young people? I'm going to skip this one. I'll just say based on this that, you know, people will sometimes ask you, well, if statins reduce my risk of heart disease, then why should I wait until I'm like 60 to start reducing it when I've already spent like 40 years developing like atherosclerotic plaques? And that may be true, but the number needed to treat, I don't think we have enough data to identify the people who would benefit the most. And so the number needed to treat is going to be super high. And that's why we don't do it. Theoretically, like maybe statins should just be in the water, but currently that's not guideline based practice. Um, similarly, oh, for Reed, those I have over a quick question about the, about the younger people. Is there yes. like specifically with that caveat of like, oh, statins maybe contribute to diabetes like if starting statins younger would make that potential diabetes effect down the line more prevalent I, and, and that that's usually the only pause I have with starting young people on statins yeah I think that's a good point the the evidence for risk of incident diabetes in like a lower moderate intensity statin in someone who doesn't have like other risk factors for diabetes, like pre-diabetes or obesity is fairly low. Um, and so, you know, I think we just don't have enough data because we haven't studied this enough, but um, I agree that this new data about diabetes would give me more pause about starting young people. So it, you're right. It's not clear that in this age group currently the risks, uh, the benefits outweigh the risks, except for those that the guidelines already recommend a statin in, which are those 20 to 39 with um, a family history of prematurity, a CVD, so male relative, uh, first degree male relative less than 55 or female relative less than 65, as well as an ele elevated LDL. Um, and then for those over seven, between like 75 to 80 in the guidelines, it's kind of a gray area. Um, if you, they have clinical ASCVD over 75, I just keep treating them the same, but um, there's not a ton of data for those over 75 for primary prevention. I think you kind of just have to take into account the individual because at that point, their like chronological and biological age have diverged a lot. Um, it could be reasonable. And I think I'm going to, in the interest of time, spend the rest of the time talking about coronary artery calcium score alternative therapies and then get into maybe one case. Um, I think this is a population where the guidelines do talk about the coronary artery calcium score being helpful. Um, because if it's zero, you're kind of done. Um, but, you know, I think you really, it, as people get older, their individual situations start to play much more of a role than um, a population-based guideline, with the exception of those with clinical ASCVD who should be continued, unless, you know, they have limited life expectancy, side effects, et cetera. Um, I think we've all kind of heard about coronary artery calcium scoring. I'm just going to briefly go over how it works, which is they literally calculate these areas and these densities and multiply them to get a score, and then they just add it up. So, like, they'll do this for the LID, the um, the CERG, and the RCA, and then add them up. Um, and basically, anybody with most people who have any calcium is going to recommend putting them on a statin. I think the, the time, the, what the calcium, coronary artery calcium score is helpful for is those people who are hesitant to take statin and you think they should be on a statin. If it's zero, then you can say, okay, let's not put you on a statin and repeat this in five years. If it's elevated, then 
usually it gives you more evidence that they need to be on a statin and that if it's super high, like over a thousand, then you can actually, you actually want to treat them aggressively um, as if they're high risk, as if they have clinical ASCV. And it can also actually, I know we've totally, aspirin has kind of totally fallen out of favor. Um, and I won't, I don't think I have time to really talk about aspirin, but basically I would say if someone is, you know, over 300 on the coronary artery calcium score and doesn't have high bleeding risk, that might actually be a situation where you'd want to use aspirin for primary prevention. So this can also help you determine if someone, um, and if they're the right age, less than 70, um, could identify both people who could benefit from a statin and aspirin for primary prevention. Um, and then just to talk about some other therapies, everybody's really excited about benfidoic acid and Nikki was talking about azetamibes. So I'll just talk about those two. Um, I think we all know about PCSK9 inhibitors and these are obviously most potent tools, but they're really gonna be reserved because of cost um, for those who really need to get their LDL like below 50. So clinical ASCVD, like progressing on therapies, not meeting goal or like true familial hypercholesterolemia. Um, for everybody else, there's azetamibe and bepidoic acid. And azetamibe has been around for a long time. I actually don't really know why we don't use it more. It's very effective and usually better tolerated than statins. It's not going to get you the same lipid lowering as a statin, but it's a good like 15% lowering and it can have synergistic effect with statins. So certainly if someone's not at goal, and these are the people like you need to be at goal. So either like high starting LDL or um, clinical ESCVD, or just like you put them on a moderate intensity statin, their LDL barely budged, you can try azetamibe. Um, and then there's this new one, bempidoic acid. If you e-consult endo, they're going to be recommending this for a lot of people because it's a prodrug. It doesn't cause myalgias. I think of it kind of similarly to azetamibe in terms of lipid lowering effects, like 10 to 15 additional percent. Um, Side effects include hyperuricemia and this like risk of tendon rupture that I think it's too new to know. I mean, it was a small risk in the studies, but um, it's a pretty new agent. So this hasn't been really a reason for me to not use it unless it's someone who I'm like particularly worried might be susceptible to this side effect. Okay, I think I'm gonna, let me see how I'm doing on time. Okay, I'm doing okay. I think I'm going to, skip this slide because it basically says that none of these complementary therapies really have much evidence for benefit. <laughs> um, question four, what is the most LDL dropped based on studies with dietary changes alone? And then after this, we can pop into some of the cases. Yes, perfect. So it's not super dramatic. Um, I don't, I don't want to feel like this talk is all about meds. Lifestyle is a huge, huge bedrock of of lipid management. And have I, I have seen people's LDL come down from like two hundred six to one forty just with lifestyle changes. It kind of depends on what your starting diet is. I mean, if you're on like a keto diet or a very high saturated fat diet, you obviously have much more room for like decrease. The only thing I want to come point out here is that we always talk about the Mediterranean diet. It does have the best evidence for cardiovascular disease prevention, but it's not really like a purely LDL lowering diet. Um, so that's, I think, something that's, it's still probably what I would recommend because what we really care about is not LDL lowering, but reduction in cardiovascular disease, but it's actually a vegetarian diet with these like plant-based foods and fiber that lowers your LDL the most. Um, and may also reduce your cardiovascular disease, disease risk. It's just that, you know, we don't really study lifestyle that well. So I don't think that we really have the studies to show that it doesn't. I would say that most people can improve on their diet. And so just simple things like one thing, just saying one thing, like reducing dietary saturated fat is usually what I do rather than trying to overwhelm people with 
a lot of different diets or advice, which can get very confusing. Um, but generally recommending more of like a plant-based diet, which all of these diets are more of a plant-based diet. I'm going to skip hypertriglyceridemia. I think this topic is pretty straightforward. Um, generally, the treatment for hypertriglyceridemia is, is the cornerstone is lifestyle and diet. And then whether you put them on fish oil first or fibrates first kind of depends on whether they're at high cardiovascular disease risk. Um, and that's all I'm going to say here on this slide. Okay. So let's do one. I think we might have time for two cases because I want to leave like a couple, maybe just one case because I want to leave a couple minutes at the end for questions. Um, Atorva is a 65-year-old woman with a history of multiple myeloma and an oral chemo drug, thoracic aortic aneurysm, B12 deficiency, and a history of DVT on dabigatran. Um, calculated ASCVD risk score for her is 7.7%. And she has no real other risk factors. Um, she did get a PET CT done for her multiple myeloma, which showed coronary calcifications. At that time, her primary care physician had recommended that she um, start a statin. And we had gotten, um, that had not been started at the time due to patient preference. And so um, I inherited this patient when I started this year and got this lipid panel. Um, and you can see the LDL is 74, which is really one of the lowest LDLs I've seen. But I was still like, well, I mean, regardless of your LDL, you have coronary calcifications, so we should do something. So if you had this patient in your clinic, what would you do next? All right. Yeah, so to summarize, basically a patient, known coronary calcifications on imaging, but low LDL, ESCVD risk score in the intermediate category, and statin hesitancy. Has never been on any lipid lowering therapy previously. Can we do um, a poll for this as well? Thank you. Sorry about that. Okay. Most popular answer A. Okay, I love it because this is another multi answer question, and both of those answers are correct. So, A is actually correct. I mean, you already know the answer that they have coronary calcification, so you don't really need the coronary artery calcium scan. But in this case, like the patient's basically like, I'm not going to start a statin because I don't think I need one. And so in this case, I found that I wanted to do an additional tool that might kind of push them more towards, um, or not even push them more towards something. I mean, I don't want to push people towards something, but like give additional information that might just solidify the evidence that we already have that this person has coronary calcifications and should be on a statin. Um, you know, the aspirin, it can also guide decisions about aspirin, but this patient, I don't know if I even highlighted that, but they're on dabigatran, and so I wouldn't also start them on aspirin because the bleeding risk just wouldn't be worth it for the prevention risk. I mean, prevention benefit. There's some questions in the chat that I'll read, but I guess my question is like, yeah. isn't a coronary artery calcium score basically the same idea as any other CT scan? Like, I guess- yeah. So this is, this is actually exactly what this slide is. Oh. Thank you, Nikki, for setting me up for this slide. Um, so the only difference between a coronary artery scan and a normal CT or PET scan or any other chest imaging is it actually, it's gated. And I don't, that's like an electrical engineering term, but basically what it means is it uses an EKG. They're like doing an EKG at the same time that they're scanning you. And so they know like what um, part of the cycle your heart is in and using that information helps them like get a better picture of the heart. Because if you think about it, most times when you're getting a chest CT, you're not getting it to look at the heart. You're getting it to look at the, th the other thoracic organs. And so this is like a type of chest CT that's protocol to look at the coronary arteries of the heart, unlike other chest CTs. And that's why it's much easier for this type of scan to actually make a quantitative measurement of coronary calcium 
Whereas you can do it from the other types of CTs, but it's very uncommonly done. It's going to be a qualitative measurement. And the quantitative measurement can be helpful. I mean, it is a difference to have a coronary calcium score of two versus 2000. So um, that's a difference. Yeah, and, I guess. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah, I guess like my thought always was if it's significant enough to be seen on just a run of the mill CT, it's probably enough that I'd want to treat it. Yeah, no, that's right. Um, there were there's some weirdness with that. I mean, I did read some studies where people had like calcifications and that they, they got they got the coronary artery calcium scan that was zero. And I was like, <laughs> that makes me not trust the coronary artery calcium scan. But, you know, those scans are not really intended to be used in that way. So you can't quantify it. I think that's like the hard part. But yes, like if that patient had said, yes, I see, cor you see coronary artery calcifications, you have atherosclerosis, you should be on a statin, they would be like, and they said, yes, I should be on a statin, then I wouldn't have gotten the scan. So yeah. it's only because they were like, my LDL is 74. I really don't think I need a statin. And I was like, no, I really think you need a statin that I got the scan. Um, um Oh, sorry, Some questions. Once you get like one coronary artery calcium score, these are from the chat. Is there any utility? Like when, when do you repeat one? Yeah. So the recommendations that I found were that um, the recommendation was to repeat it in five years with people with a coronary artery calcium scan score of five, uh, sorry, of zero or less or greater than 400. And I think the reasoning behind that with zero makes a lot of sense because if it's zero now, it might not be zero in five years. And then with 400, I think you're just trying to look at the progression. I'm not really sure why the recommendation for greater than 400, because I don't think it would really change management. Um, th th there's a weirdness there that like being on a statin actually increases your coronary artery score for reasons that I don't fully understand. So that's an additional nuance. But the point is the, the people you really want to repeat it in are the people who have a coronary artery um, calcium score of zero, because then like in five years, if it's not zero, it's going to change your management. Um, in this person, like I probably wouldn't because their coronary artery calcium score showed like high risk with the score of 591, um, with, and I'm already treating with like a high intensity statin to get their, um, and their LDL is already 74. So it's like, it's going to be at goal. So I, I guess we could get one in five years. I'm not really sure. Like unless it's over a thousand at that point, I guess at that point it would change management because you would be like viewing them as clinical ASCVD. In him, it actually still wouldn't, or her, it actually still wouldn't change management because their LDL is going to be like 20. But I guess it could change management if you started someone on like a moderate intensity or even a high intensity statin, but weren't targeting like a super low LDL and the next one's like 1800, you know, and then you're wanting to treat them like clinical ASCVD. So those are the recommendations. You repeat it in five years if it's zero or greater than 400. Um, the other just thing I wanted to point out, we're kind of running out of time, um, is the nice thing about the coronary artery calcium scores. You can see the distribution of where the calcium is, which like, I think the one that's really associated with badness is in the left main, which like our scans don't actually report out the left main. Because there's like studies that show that if it's all in the left main, that's like independently a factor for badness, which is um, not surprising. His was all in the LD LAD, which could all be in the left main, but it, it's certainly not good to have it all kind of be in the LAD. So um, that's kind of another advantage of doing the scan. But I agree with everyone who said like, you didn't need to do the scan in this case necessarily for management. Like you already had enough information to put them on a statin. The only reason I did the scan is it was like to convince the patient that they actually need to be on a statin. Um, I don't think we have time for more cases, but we can like circulate the slides. The other cases are, yeah, I think I already kind of went over the content of the cases and the other ones, so. Okay, any other, like in the last, I guess just one minute, <laughs> I can stick around if anybody has any like additional questions. Hi, Arita, can you hear me? I can. Sorry for all the questions. Thank you for this awesome talk. You can clearly tell it's a topic. You got all the fire, all the primary care third years fired up in the chat. But um, I have two that. questions and I'm sorry uh -huh. if others want to leave. But my first question, I just wanted you to clarify, is there a, when you get a coronary artery calcium and you see calcium, does do you think of that as like, is that a diagnosis of coronary artery disease? We now are in the secondary prevention area or we're still in the primary prevention? Still primary prevention. So there's no, you can't say anything about obstructive CAD 
um, awesome. at all. No score. Well, no. you cross except it. for so that, you'd need like a coronary CTA. Okay, I mean, awesome. this just isn't designed to do that. Um, and interestingly, then, in those less than 40, I just wouldn't get this because actually like there's some people less than 40 who can have a score of zero, but obstructive CAD because they just haven't had time to build calcium. So um, it's high sensitivity for, but low specificity. So if it's like non-zero, then like they have some probability of obstructive CAD, but if they have coronary calcium, you cannot make any conclusion. Sorry, if they have no coronary calcium, then they probably don't have obstructive CAD in people over 40. But if they do have coronary calcium, there's very low specificity for saying whether or not they have obstructive CAD. You cannot draw any conclusion about that. Gotcha. That, but that is not true for people under 40. For under people under 40, even the sensitivity is not good. So I would just think of it as not useful for that purpose. Okay. So use it in folks over 40. It's still primary prevention. Thank you for clarifying. And then my yeah. last question. And I'm then, sorry. yeah, I would just say if it's greater than a thousand though, then those people are treated like clinical ASCVD. You still don't know anything about obstructive CAD, but you do treat them like secondary prevention. Thank you. Um, Arita, did you come across anything in your research about starting Zedia or that new fancier one you mentioned the like B1 for folks who just have refused to use a statin? Yes. Because of I will effects? actually... For those who have like time, I will actually do the second case because this is exactly about that. So I'll just talk about it briefly. Thank like you. if you need to leave, feel free to leave. Um, so this was a patient I had that had type two diabetes. I didn't. This is based on an e consult to lipid clinic. Um, both type two diabetes and a, his father had an MI age fifty. So like I consider that to be a first degree relative with premature ASCDV in my like own mental like triage of risk factors. I consider pretty high up there. And he refused to take a statin because of myalgias. So he, I put him on his zetamide and I was like, yeah, pretty good. Like his LDL did what I'd expect, 123 to 97. But then I was like, I don't know if that's enough with his history. And like he has diabetes, he should really be on a statin. And we don't really know if a zetamide has the same like cardiovascular, like this is going to the weeds, but lipids have cardiovascular disease risk prevention that's not just related to lipid lowering. And I don't think we have the same evidence for is that a by monotherapy. So um, I e-consulted endo and they actually um, suggested starting bevidoic acid. So it is a good option, not only for those who can't get to goal, but also those who are statin intolerant. Does that answer the question? Say, yeah, no, does, did they say stop the Zedia? They said like stop Zedia, start Bendo. No, they actually said use it in conjunction with Zedia because it can lower lipids. It said in their e-consult, they said in conjunction with Zetamide can lower lipids 25% further. So I don't know if that's like just purely additive or there's some synergy. I know there's like there's synergies between Zedia and statins. So there may be similar synergies. That's so helpful. Thank you so much. I have a patient I've seen tomorrow who I think this might happen for her. So thank you for the Yeah, great. Yeah. <laughs> yeah, I don't know anything about cost. I haven't started the patient on this. I'm hopeful that it's like somewhat affordable on like some of these other newer drugs. Any other? Questions? Thank you so much, Arita. What this really taught me, I think, and I suspect many of the residents would agree, is like we could probably do a whole day just on lipids. I feel like the more I learn, the more complex it gets, like osteoporosis. <laughs> yeah, I mean, I think like the complexities really come in how aggressive to be in primary prevention. Um, because if it's like secondary prevention or familial, it's pretty clear, but yeah. And maybe too big of a topic for one day. <laughs> um, well, I really appreciate it. And thank you everyone for your excellent participation. And we will see you next time. All right. Thanks, Arita. Bye. Thanks, everyone. Bye.